we're going to semi seamlessly transition um, into the fireside chat. And so I would like to invite up to the stage Beth Kolko, who is the CEO of Shift Labs, to have a conversation with me. Good to see you. All right, so Beth, we want to hear about Shift Labs. And so I was wondering if you could tell the audience just a little bit about what your company does and kind of an idea of how you got started here um, and maybe talk a little bit about your involvement in Seattle Angel Conference. Thanks very much, Jeff. So I uh, used to be, still officially am, a professor at the University of Washington. And several years ago, I was doing what professors do, so publishing a lot of articles and getting a lot of grants and building a lot of prototypes and saw some of the challenges in commercializing medical devices when you want to build things that are low cost. So I decided to start a company that was going to figure out how to create medical devices that would be very simple to use and affordable, that would meet the needs of global markets, uh, and be sustainable and profitable. So we really wanted to be a for-profit, not a non-profit. We wanted to take advantage of the enormous uh, global market opportunity with the expanding medical sector outside the U.S. I think if you look at the numbers, the U.S. healthcare sector is something like 17% uh, of the global total. Like most of the market opportunity is outside the US. And no one's really building products for those markets. So that's what we set out to do. And we, uh, let's see, in 2013 we did Fledge. So Looney is here. <laughs> and uh, we applied to, we, I can't remember which SAC we were in. John, where's John? Had to be early. I mean, two, three, somewhere in there, right? I think it was 2013. Uh, yeah. I think, it was, I think it was also 2013. Okay. And uh, we were one of the finalists. We did not win, and we, uh, but the process of going through was very clarifying for the company. And after that, we subsequently, um, no offense to your Seattle um, enthusiasm, but we ended up going down to California and uh, going through Y Combinator. So that's what we did in 2015. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important point to, to pause on. I mean, I did just spend 15 minutes telling you how wonderful Seattle is. Um, and that's not true in every instance, and certainly not true for every industry. And so I wonder if you could kind of talk about some of the challenges that you did face in Seattle in trying to raise. So we faced a variety of challenges, many of which are familiar. Uh, for those of you in the, in the room who've built companies, I'm sure you've experienced all of these. So some of them were very, very common, and some of them were uncommon. Uh, and so the uncommon ones I think are more interesting, so I'll talk about those. Uh, we set out to do something that was new. Uh, we wanted to build new kinds of products and we wanted to serve new kinds of markets and we wanted to build new kinds of business models around that. And that meant it was incredibly risky. And so we needed an environment that had a very high appetite for risk. So when people talk about the Seattle fundraising scene, often what comes up is this notion of appetite for risk and it not necessarily being the highest here. Um, so I think that was one of the challenges that we faced was we were trying to do a lot that was very risky. And it, it still is risky. I mean, you know, we have our regulatory clearances and we're on the market and we have happy customers, but terrible things can happen at any point. That's just startup life. Um, another thing that was really interesting for us, which I didn't, I didn't realize at the outset, is because we were doing medical devices in a region that actually has a very robust medical device sector, especially up in Bothell, mm -hmm. there was a lot of expectation of what we were. And so we were just a little bit off that, right? Because we were going after different markets. And then the other piece, this, this just blew me away. I had no idea this was going to be an issue. But again, there's a tremendous amount of global health nonprofit activity here in Seattle. There's a very big foundation some of you may have heard of. Uh, and so there was a lot of expectation of, well, why are you a for-profit if you're trying to serve the same kinds of markets? that the Gates Foundation wraps its work around. And so it took us, actually, it took us an embarrassingly long <clears throat> amount of time to figure out that issue for us. Makes sense. And, and I wonder, if, too, if you could talk a little bit about Y Combinator. Um, so we, we were talking last night, John and I were talking last night, and we believe actually that there's now been uh, four Seattle Angel Conference participants that have gone through Y Combinator, which is an interesting data point. Um, and I wonder for you, you know, what, what is it that you find that, that YC gave you? Um, you know, and do you think that that's something that is unique to that program? Is it something that we can replicate here? Is it something we should replicate here? It's a lot in there, I realize. Yeah, that's, hmm. So YC gave us a tremendous amount in terms of the company. Uh, I'll say I benefited also a lot quite uh, personally. Uh, they were the... And they were the really the, the, they were one of the first people to really get behind us. 
besides Fledge, Looney, I see you there. Um, and that was really validating. So that was very important to us um, and to me uh, personally. I was very nervous going down there because I do not look like a typical founder. I'm old, I'm a woman. And um, it, I found it to be the most welcoming community I'd ever been a part of. It was, sh it was shocking, it really. Well, did you find that the other founders did look like founders or was that a stereotype that didn't fit across the board? It was a stereotype that didn't fit. Yeah. I mean, there were plenty of people that looked like typical mm -hmm. founders. It's also a numbers game, right? There are like 100 companies in yeah. our batch. Uh, but YC is a group that is using their considerable financial and cultural clout to very proactively work on diversity issues. They're not always public about it, uh, but they're working really hard behind the scenes, and I respect that. Mm -hmm. uh, from a company standpoint, the thing, and there's a couple, I know there's a couple medical device entrepreneurs in here. The most valuable thing that they did for us as a medical device company is they taught us that we should go fast, just like any other kind of company. There are a lot of expectations in the medical device sector that things take forever. And actually, they don't need to take forever. And if you can throw that expectation out the window and figure out what are the places that, or the ways that you can go fast, how do you get customer validation when you're still working on regulatory issues, uh, that was, again, very inspirational for us. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that is a, a model that we should try and replicate here in Seattle? Why not? Sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I found it, uh, yeah, I think it's a great model. Now, whether it can be replicated here, I don't know. It's, it's, it, they're a unique group. Again, it's a numbers game. There's just, there's more people, there's more money down there. But who knows what's going to happen to Seattle over the next five or 10 years? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do, I think it's one of those situations where uh, it's a bit of a rising tide raises all boats, right? And so you saw the slide about all the stuff that's new in the very early stage of the ecosystem. Okay. Those of us then in the VC space need to raise up and start raising some funds. And by the way, it's our perspective that there could probably be five more funds doing exactly what we're doing and still not saturate the market. But once that comes to pass, then it you know pushes the bubble back to the early stage of the ecosystem and then maybe more accelerators, more incubators are needed and can be supported. So we'll see. So what's your opinion on incubators that are industry specific? Because you have a, a fund that's industry specific. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that model can work. I mean, it's to your point, it's a numbers game, right? And so I think that the the number of potentially interesting ideas and talent need to be commensurate with the aspirations of the particular incubator. I mean, it's probably worth discerning between incubator and accelerator, right? So for those who don't know the difference and. This is my definition and others may have another, but to me an incubator is something that is about idea creation. And so you know, it may have a set of talent, it may have a set of resources, but it's about creating the idea in the first place, testing it, and then, and then releasing it to the wild. Whereas an accelerator is where a more or less intact team and idea come into the accelerator with the idea of being, imagine, accelerated. Uh, and there's a program and a set of opportunities for them to accelerate the business. So that's, that's how I distinguish. And so I think on incubator, it has to be enough raw talent, enough guidance and mentors and people who can help, and enough funding, of course, to have sort of escape velocity for the things that are coming out of the incubator. Can I ask you another question? Of course. I know you're supposed to be interviewing me, but. So when we, so Jeff and I talked on the phone a little bit just to get set, settled here. And so you mentioned Flying Fish, Series A, and that you know maybe we could talk about fundraising or Series A. And one of the things that, that you said to me, which I thought was amazing and great, she said, well, you're obviously a company we would never fund. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> uh, when you're raising money, uh, the slow no is the worst. I mean, obviously the best is the fast yes, but the, the, slow no, the fast no is the second best. And so you have a real clarity of vision in how you've created what your portfolio is going to be. And so can you maybe share with other entrepreneurs in the room how you communicate that and, and maybe signs that they should look for when they're reaching out both to angels and funds like yours? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, yeah, so first, thank you for saying that I said something good, so that I'm doing something good, so that's good to know. Um, and to be really clear of why I said what I said to Beth was not any uh, dispersion on her company whatsoever, but simply it doesn't fit what we're doing in terms of the investment thesis, so it's, it's not the kind of deal that we do. So. So just clarify that. Um, but you know, I do agree entirely that the fast no is important, even within the industries that we do focus on. So I mean, we want to be uh, very quick to decide and, and helpful, even in the case where we're saying no. So we want to make sure that there's a destination for the company to go in the case we say no. But we don't want to ever be in the business of like stringing a company along, because it's just not good or beneficial for anybody. 
Um, and so in terms of how we think about it, you know, we have an investment thesis. So I mentioned, you know, it is basically capital efficient software startup. So start from that. The first filter is simply, can it credibly be seen to be one of those? Um, and there are gray areas to that. I mean, sometimes you see a, a deal, and we've done one, where there is a hardware component, for example. And so you have to do the analysis of like, is there enough software in here that it fits our thesis or not? And we managed to convince ourselves in that case that it, that it was. Um, but something that's clearly outside of that thesis, we want to just be quick to say, look, this is not the kind of deal that we do. Here's who does. Um, and one of the challenges in Seattle is the here's who does is often a null set. Um, and that's tough. I hate that. Like, I hate having to say, I don't know anyone who invests in the industry that you're in. That's not a happy answer. Um, but anyway, if it's within our thesis, then I think it's just a matter of, okay, then run through the rest of the checklist of, you know, is it the kind of team, is it the kind of market opportunity, is it the kind of product that we want to see? And then we'll look at it and then take it from there. So I want to go back to this notion of here's who does and, and revisit the comment you made earlier that Seattle, you know, maybe one of the things that we'll see is more incubators and accelerators and things like that. So when we started our company, um, we were not a seasoned startup team and uh, there were, you know, I had come from academia, which was not seen as a benefit uh, in a lot of quarters, although I would say that professors are really great at learning new stuff, so yay. Um, the value for us in Fledge and then in Y Combinator was about the network. It was huge for us because we didn't come in, you know, m my co-founders and I, we all came from very modest financial backgrounds. You know, this notion of a friends and family round, like we didn't have friends and family that had any money. That wasn't gonna be what we're, how we raised an initial seed round. Um, but the, so the networks of those accelerators were incredibly important for us, not just access to capital, but access to, um, access to mentors, uh, different kinds of advisors, and also just understanding the nitty, nitty gritty of how do you build a company, and it's really hard, and there's not a roadmap for it. So the, those networks were really crucial, so I think Seattle really could benefit from having uh, a larger ecosystem there. It's, a, it's, just, it's kind of a leg up for folks. Yep. So, um, all right, so going back to you, um, talk a little bit about, okay, where do you go from here? So you've come out of Y Combinator, you know, the business is kind of going, what's the next step? Is it a raise? If so, how do you think about it? How do you think about where you're going to raise? All those good questions. I mean, I, of course I want to hear you say Seattle, but I know that in your particular <laughs> industry that may not be the answer. Um, well, we don't have, we have, I guess we have a couple investors from Seattle. So. We raised a seed round after YC. So we did a little friends and family at the end of 2014, and then in the spring of 2015, we did a seed round. And so we're still running off of that. We're pretty, uh, I would say we're amazingly capital efficient for a medical device company. Uh, and we, we go back and forth, you know, about whether we're gonna raise. I'm in a position now where I think so. I think that's what I'm gonna do. I know I should be more committed to that. But honestly, if I can get my sales up to the point where I don't have to, that's what I would prefer to do. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple big corporate deals that we're working on which would give us the same kind of acceleration that, that a Series A raise would. Yep. So I'm sort of in a wait and see over the next four to six weeks to see what happens with those partnerships. Um, if not, then we'll go ahead and do, uh, uh, do a Series A. So just as background, so we are on the market, we're selling a product. Uh, it is a very inexpensive product, so we have to sell a whole lot of them. Uh, in order to make a lot of money. And this is why medical devices are expensive. I've learned way too much about the industry. It, it depresses me as a human, I will say. Good design is not gonna solve healthcare. I'll just say that out there. Um, so for us, we you know we like to hinge on sales. It keeps us close to those customers and it helps us build our additional products. Uh, raising for us is gonna be about a combination of going back to existing investors uh, and then probably, honestly, using the YC network. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It, on, on that point, I mean, one of the questions that I get asked, get asked a lot is um, how to think about angels and angels re-upping in deals. Um, is that something you've experienced? Like, have you gone back to your existing angel investors and said, okay, it's time to re-up, and what's your experience been with that? Yeah, so I've, because so two things, we, we did go back, and I want to talk about the difference of angel and institutional money. Um, from an entrepreneur's standpoint, uh, we we had to we had to raise a hundred thousand dollars just to convert a note. Like we were in this stupid situation where we had no coming due, and 
we just needed to convert it. And the investors were all like, just lower it to 100,000. And three of them were like, here's a check. And that was it. Like, I, I, it was December. I didn't want to, I was going to Sierra Leone. We'd gotten a little uh, grant money from USAID for the Ebola crisis. So I was on my way to Sierra Leone to deal with Ebola. And I did not want to have to be fundraising <laughs> at the same time. So actually, I didn't really want to be going to Sierra Leone during Ebola time either. But uh, so, anyway, we, so which was le less appealing? Ebola. So, yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> um, and the, so that, yeah, so we had existing investors. They just wrote the checks, and then we converted the note, and, and that was that. So we haven't raised since then. Uh, we have a, a combination of institutional money and angel money. And there's four institutional players who, two of whom I really want to participate, uh, and I'm pretty sure that they will. Like we've, I've had lots of conversations with them. And the reason I want them to participate is because we're at the point now where we want those introductions and those connections. So because we're in the medical space, there's a lot of value that investors who are players in that space bring to us, whether it's pilots or customers, uh, hires, um, hiring a director of sales for a medical device company is actually really challenging. And the angels are people who were behind our mission, had a huge appetite for risk. They're great cheerleaders. And some of them have good networks, but the really deep uh, networks and the expertise in medical is gonna come from those institutional players. And that's where I wanna go back. Yeah, I mean, I, you also raise another interesting topic. I think it's, we could spend a lot of time on it. We'll take some questions from the audience, by the way, in a few minutes, so just queue them up. Um, is the notion of, hey, maybe I don't need to raise because my revenue's kicking up, right? And I think that that's important to think about as a founder is like, when, when do you really need to raise money? When do you want to raise money? When is it an option to raise money? Um, and really thinking through that and the dilution that comes with raising money, um, but also the acceleration, like what's that? What's the trade-off? And I think that too much, and, I, and I'll, I'll pick on the valley a little bit, I think this is a, a little bit of a valley mentality of like, of course I'm gonna raise Series E. Like, of course I'm gonna raise $100 million. Like, that's just what you do. Well, yeah, some businesses that's what you do, but is that the right thing for your business? You should understand that before going out and seeking investment. So that's a great point. We spent a lot of time talking about this internally, and one of the great things about YC is they taught us to ignore vanity metrics. Like, they just hammered that. Like, how much money you raise doesn't matter. How many employees you have doesn't matter. How, much, what's your, how many square foot is your office doesn't matter. Like, to them, those are vanity metrics. How are you doing with your customers? Right. Like, do they love what you've built? The, that's what they really fo you know, taught us to, to focus on. And that, so I think the question of when to raise and how much to raise can f easily fall into that vanity metric. So for us, if we need operating cash, absolutely. Uh, if we're um, at an inflection point where we want to introduce a new product and you know, there's a growth opportunity there, then that's the time to raise money to grow. Um, but like I said, we have these potential strategic partners that might actually make more sense for yep. what our business model is. Yeah, I mean, it's again, this is not a space that I understand tremendously well, but it seems to be that is a pretty standard model of medical devices is to get a strategic investor that's also your acquirer, right? Uh, Medtronic seems to be the one that everyone wants to get in this space. I don't know if that's the case for you, but. Well, actually, BD just bought Bard, and before that, they bought CareFusion, so you know, there's, yeah. Many, there's plenty of options. Many options, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, well, if you don't mind, you want to turn it over to the audience and take some questions? All right, let's do it. So really the do. question was, what do I love about uh, having starting a medical device company, the top three things? Uh, the first thing that I love is the opportunity to make a difference. Um, and, and it's so hard. Honestly, yeah. I tell most people not to do it because it's so hard. But so I, I said that we, you know, we started this company to make devices that would help people outside the U.S. primarily. Um, it, as it happens, most of my customers right now are in the U.S. And so I have built a product that is letting patients in rural America, like Alabama and Kentucky, poor patients get their chemotherapy safely. And that, like on the really hard days, I just think about that. Because that, that's amazing. Like that, it is, it's worth getting out of bed for that. Um, so the fact that I can help, because I want to help my country too, our healthcare is insane. Uh, and so that's, that's really the top thing is like making a difference and knowing, for me, knowing I can introduce more equity into the world, you know, make things more equitable. Um, so that's the top thing. The other things, maybe the second is about the kind of team that I can build. And we, 
I am constantly getting applications from people who want to join our company. And part of that is because there's a lot of engineers out there who want to be do something that's more meaningful to them. And so I find that hiring is actually not, not that hard for a medical device company, but if, if you're doing you know, something that can resonate with people in terms of a mission and lowering costs. So that's been great, because we, then we have an amazing team. Um, I, the third thing is I, I, I like messing with systems a little bit. Uh, and if I can sort of poke at things and make a little bit of change, that's really great for me. And the medical device industry is, <laughs> um, the incentive structures are, they're just not what you would want. I don't even know how to begin articulating it in a platform like this. But one thing that we did as a company is we created a GitHub repo called Startup FDA, where we just put all our FDA applications documents online. Because it's this industry that is dominated by really high paid consultants who don't want to tell you anything unless you're paying them $600 an hour. Like they're incredibly expensive and there's no templates out there. Like no one can tell you exactly what the FDA is looking for. You're supposed to read these standards, but then the standards themselves cost hundred of dollars. That's a racket. Uh, so we were like, okay, we are, we're just going to help democratize medical device innovation and we're going to just make this GitHub. So we, we created it and then we're getting other people to put their documents in too. So, for me, in medical device, there's so much opportunity for helping to improve things. Like, the bar is super low. Uh, so I like that. From my perspective, anything's fair game. So we've been talking about sort of a context, but if people have any questions on anything related to investing, I'm happy to right, field I'll, them. I'll, over here. I'll go. It's Looney. Uh, so um, uh, what's one assumption it took you a few years to figure out you, you, you had but didn't know you had? So I was just talking to Looney about this. It's a plant. Uh, so we built a, a device that's low cost and it doesn't have um, like a consumable that goes with it. So for medical devices and actually your product has the consumable, right? And that's the, that recurring revenue is really important to companies. So we wanted to build something that was going to work in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, you know, everywhere. And supply chain is actually a massive problem. So we're like, okay, no proprietary consumable. And so with uh, what we built, uh, it's for uh, medication delivery. And there's those little drip sets that you see next to, you know, hanging on an IV pole. Uh, those are the consumable for our product. We're like, okay, we're not going to make a proprietary drip set. We're going to make a product that will work with any drip set that someone happens to have in their supply closet. So it's great for, I'll just say, a very large uh, global health NGO that works with a lot of doctors uh, who now carries our product uh, because they can use it in their camps wherever, in DRC, South Sudan, because there's no proprietary consumable. Great for our customers. Our model is to work with distributors. Distributors hate that because they want the recurring revenue. And so that was that. So now we're sort of working around that problem. So we were like, this is great. Customers will love it. And customers do love it. But we need distributors to get to the customers. Got another question right here? Yeah, so this question's for, uh, for both of you, Jeff and Beth. Um, so I've, I've been doing a little bit of what you're doing, Beth. Uh, growing a company. Uh, and I love Seattle, and we've done some raises in Seattle, but we also went to California, and we've done uh, some raises down there. And uh, valuation keeps coming up. And so in the interest, Jeff, of trying to increase um, the attractiveness of the Seattle market, I'd like to hear what your thought is on bringing the valuations up possibly to match the competition in valuations that tends to occur in California. And Beth, I'm wondering, did you see some of that difference in valuations? Let me take this one first. I, I want to hear what you have to say. Well, so I, it's, it's interesting. We, we sort of started out playing around a little bit with this notion that it's an advantage to us as a firm that valuations tend to be lower here in Seattle than in the Valley. And we quickly abandoned that because we believe a couple of things. Number one, that ultimately markets are efficient and that capital is, you know, transportable. And so ultimately this, this kind of big delta that exists today will go away. And we also believe fundamentally that it should go away. And there's no real reason for the valuations to be different. It's a supply and demand problem. It's, you know, but we don't think this should be different. And so we actually would like to see more of an equi equilibrium between here and the Valley. Now, that probably means Seattle valuations need to come up. It probably also means Valley valuations need to come down. Um, and market forces tend to have that effect over time. So I guess we'll see. Uh, absolutely, we saw a difference. And we, we raised. Our whole seed round pretty much came in after during the YC demo day, so it was 
You know, and they told us, they said, this is, this is going to be the easiest money you ever raise. It could be the last money you ever raise. Uh, it is a compl it's a completely artificial um, situation. But the valuation we got there, yeah, and I think it was probably much higher than we would have gotten here, but it was certainly lower than a lot of our batchmates. Uh, part of that is my, I'm by nature a pretty uh, con conservative person financially. Uh, and I have a couple friends here in Seattle who run medical device companies, and I know what their valuations have been, and they have been much lower. Alex. I, I was interested in your distribution problem and uh, whether you've got a solution to that. I think in SAC, when you were in SAC, that was a question about how you were going to distribute your product. And it looks like your current distribution is into a totally different market than what you anticipated. So to get to Sub-Saharan Africa, what are you going to have to do? We have a couple distributors in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have South Africa, Kenya, and then Southern Africa, so like Namibia and Malawi and those countries covered. The reason we have more sales in the U.S. is simply a matter of speed. We want sales immediately, and our international distributors are slower. And if you talk to any company, that's always the case. So when someone in the U.S. calls me or emails us and says they're interested in the product, we can, get on, we can get on a plane if we need to. Like We can go see them and we can force the sale that week, and that's what we've been doing. Because we want those early customers, we want the feedback, we want the traction, we want the revenue. Uh, so we're still using the international distributor model, but we recognize that it takes longer than we want to wait. The gap between the consumables, right, what distributors want and customers, the way we've solved that problem is our first strategic partnership, which is with a distributor in another country, in a developed country, uh, who wants our product and wants it with a proprietary consumable. And so like, we're, we've negotiated the contract in principle, right? We're s signing it this week. Um, but that, what that deal says is they're underwriting the product development for the version with the proprietary consumable. Mm -hmm. We make a little bit of money off of each consumable, but we don't have to make them because the MOQs are like 100,000. We don't want to deal with that inventory. So they deal with all of that and they deal with the sterilization. We make a little bit of money and they buy our hardware. And then we can sell that combination in any country we want. So it's a combination, but we'll still have that versatile product that will work with any drip set, which is going to be appealing to certain market segments. We have another question here. Hi there. Um, my interest is women in investing. And I'm just wondering, um, do you have any women on your cap table? And uh, if not, why do you think there's um, not very many women in, in investing, and, and if you do, um, is there any difference in approach in, in the women investors that you do have on, in your cap table? So we do have women on our cap table, not a lot. Um, I'm reviewing the cap table in my head now. Um, the reason, uh, that's a big question. I think it gets at, at issues of gender politics, dynamics within family units, and appetite for risk. I think it's a really complicated question that doesn't have to do with investing, but has to do with the role of women in society at large. Um, that's, yeah. You don't, you don't feel like we have time to delve into all of those topics today? <laughs> Strangely, no. All right, you guys have anything else to say? Just a big thank you to the community and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So we have some great sponsors that are providing some support for the entrepreneurs. We want to get more entrepreneurs to be successful enough to be angel investors so that we amplify the cycle.